talk about the magic of photography. Um, and uh, before I get started with his bio and some other uh, information, uh, I just want to tell you about some other related programming. You probably know already that we have Ansel Adams, uh, Ansel Adams exhibit coming in this summer. And we're also really excited about a jury exhibit of photography called Our National Parks, which is going to be up here in the Art Tree Gallery. We, uh, we that that uh, hall is open until April 3rd, and so uh, we, we want photographers to go out and continue to photograph our national parks and submit to that call. It's going to be a really exciting summer of photography for the Crypto Tree Art Center. And so in relationship to that, um, we have some, uh, we're developing a, a docent program. You know that we give docent tours to, to our school kids. And this Ansel Adams uh, exhibit is going to run through, through September, actually, through September 30th. And we're so excited about that because that means our area students are going to be able to come through and tour this um, exhibition. And we also have adult tours. I don't know if you know that. Some of you know, but we offer adult tours a couple times a month. And uh, in the summer, we'll also be adding adult evening tours. So to do this, to accomplish this, we really need a great team of docents. So I'm really excited to tell you that both John and Elizabeth Fergus Jean are helping us organize a really great docent program, a docent education program. So uh, this is the, the first in a series of talks we're going to have to help prepare folks for the docent program. So it's a copy of 10 lecture, but it's also doing dual duty in helping to prepare interested folks for uh, our adult children's hosting program. So if you're interested in more photography related talks just for enrichment or to help prepare you for volunteering as a docent, I have a little clipboard over there with a space for your name and email address if you'd like more information about upcoming talks and opportunities that we have. Uh, you know, also in relationship to that, we have a great summer workshop program. All kinds of great photographers coming in all kinds of great programming for photographers at every level, from the novice, working with their iPhone, to um, really expert photographers, so, um, and, and on a range of topics. So please stay tuned for our great um, collection of workshop. I'm really excited about what all this programming is going to do for photography at, um, at the Crooked Tree Art Center. You know, we have a photographic society here. We have a lot of um, active photographers in Charlevoix and in the area. We're so excited about the community that all this programming is going to build here. So, uh, before I go on to the bio, I just want you to know that we have some other upcoming talks. Uh, Copy of 10 talks. Our next Copy of 10 is called Art, Ed, Art Making as Contemplative Practice with Brian Shorn. He's one of the uh, artists exhibiting in the Tinker Taylor Weldon Weaver Art of Austin Lodge exhibition. On April 25th, we have a talk called Art Education in Our Schools. And then on May 16th, Art and Gardens with the Petoskey Area Garden Club. Um, we also have a docent enrichment lecture series. Uh, during the last exhibition, we had some talks on two-dimensional design and materials and, and design principles. This time, we have a survey of photographic techniques and design elements and principles and techniques of three-dimensional work. So on March 8th, no, on February 22nd, actually that's tomorrow. We have um, design elements and principles and techniques of three-dimensional. So there'll be a talk about um, how to look at three-dimensional work and how to analyze it sort of aesthetically and formally. And then on March 8th, uh, Gretchen Dorian's going to come in and talk about alternative processes in relationship to photographic techniques. And then on March 27th, we'll revisit, not March, so March 22nd, we'll revisit design elements in relationship to so those are some upcoming talks. You're always invited um, to docent talks, whether you want to be a docent or you just want to do it for enrichment. It's you know general interest, so you're all welcome to do that. So I'm so excited that John Fergus Jean is going to talk here. We just talked a little earlier about doing this two-part uh, lecture because there's so much to talk about. I mean, photography's been around for a long time. There's so many really great and exciting topics to talk about. So he's going to do like an introduction today. His talk is called The Magic of Photography. And uh, I want you to know a little bit about John Fergus Jean. He was, he's an emeritus professor at Columbus College of Art and Design. He was formerly the curator of photography at the Columbus Museum of Art and director of the Ross Photography Study Center there. 
He's taught a wide range of both technical and theoretical photography courses, including photographic thought, digital imaging, history and aesthetics of photography issues, and contemporary photography, and graduate art theory and criticism. He has received state and national grants for his work and his photographs and writings on photography. Uh, they've been published internationally and in the Focal Encyclopedia of Photography and received an AB in Political Science from Indiana University and an MFA in Photography from the Rochester Institute of Technology. And um, I want to welcome John Bruce.
that reality of a sort replaced our imaginings. We took the camera with us to give us a different viewpoint, a, a different station point to understand who we are and where we are. We can look at this information and get a lot of information from it, but we can also look at it metaphorically and think, wow, we, this is us, this glowing globe surrounded by darkness. So, that's kind of a magic, because it's a conjuring between two different languages, the language of what we perceive, and then this other kind of language of what we know. Now, photography literally is called writing with light. And that is what photography means. So writing suggests that it, you're using a language in order to write. Uh, I try to do that. So the language has certain properties. It can describe things, and it is connotative. If a language could only describe something, it'd be pretty worthless to us. We have to make somebody feel what we're talking about. Language also has grammar, which any of you guys diagram sentences? Yeah. Oh, fun that is. OK, grammar, which is the structure of the way you convey the information. Photography, being a language, can describe things, it can connote things, and it has a structure. So when we take, and we'll take a look at some images that, that show this, uh, we, can, we can see all of that, and we can see that it has a system of rules and uses that uh, you can see displayed right here. These are very different reports using the language of photography. And the second part of that is light. We're writing with light. And light is a physical property. No light, no vision. It really is very simple. But light is also metaphoric, as in I see the light. I understand. And so in images, what you have are a conjunction of light and darkness adjacent to each other. That which I understand that which is a mystery. Look at some of these images up here and look at the darkness and you will see it's a predominant feature. The mystery of it all is part of the magic. Okay? So light can be equated with the spirit and so on. Well, how long did we want or wish to be able to capture images? Uh, a long time. Photography will look at its invention, but really the desire for photography was invented much earlier. In this painting of the Corinthian maid, uh, which was after the fact of Pliny the Elder, what we see is that she is tracing the outline of her lover who is going on a long voyage. Why is she doing this? She's doing it to remember him because she does not want to forget. Now, we can extrapolate from that that if we can trace our own lives, we can remember them and not forget them. So the desire to fix images and have them as part of the way we understand our own journey was extremely important. Now, uh, this is one of the first cameras, by the way. And it's called a camera obscura. And uh, what I want to show you here is that inside the box is an artist. And what he's doing is he's copying the aerial image of this person right here, which is projected upside down and backwards on that screen. So the first camera was actually a room. If we want to make this room into a camera, all we'd have to do is turn the lights off and poke a hole, and it would project an image of the that is a camera. Camera actually means chamber. Obscura means dark. So it is a darkened chamber. And, uh, and this, this was uh, a, a kind of tracing. The thought was we could get better paintings that way. Now what it actually did was it, it uh, created Renaissance perspective in the view, which took care of a lot of problems for, for artists. 
Now, why do we believe, why do we believe photographs to be true? Why, why, why is that? Is there a physiological basis? And we could say, we could, let's just take a look. There's a camera, old style, and there is the human eye. All right? What do they have in common? They both, they both have uh, openings, and they're both darkened chambers. And since they're cameras, okay? The camera has a lens in order to create sharper images. I wear glasses in order to create sharper images. My lenses are pretty bad. Okay? But I have a lens right here. Okay, now the second part is um, I can choose to shut my eyes and not see things. The camera has a shutter, which is analogous to opening and closing exposures. Uh, the third thing is if it's bright in here, it's pretty bright right now, my pupils die, or they go smaller and then they get larger. In the camera, we have a diaphragm. In the eye, we have an iris, or a diaphragm. Okay? Now, you could say lens shape or an iris, but I'm not. Okay, so then the optical image in the camera goes to a plate or a piece of film, and what that does is it records the, uh, the pattern that was before it. In our case with the eye, it goes to our brain. We don't have film. There's no projection room in your, in your brain. It goes somewhere in, 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 in the mix of things. But one of the reasons photography seems to be able to take us to where we want to go is that it's very familiar. It's the camera, in, in a sense. And here is the portable camera obscure, which was, came in a later date. And uh, they decided that the room was too big, so it became smaller and smaller and smaller, so I can take this around and I can copy nature and, and so forth. But the problem is there was still the artist's hand involved. Now we have a camera. Extraordinary image. Arresting. Entirely different. Let's look at some of the significant parts that we've discovered already. One is the camera is the extension of the, of the eye which is an extension of the brain. Right? You can't say that your eyes see any more than you can say your feet walk. You can't say that, but it doesn't make sense. You see. And so the, the camera now becomes a tool that lets us see things we have not seen before. It's an extraordinary tool. It also, its main text is darkness and light. And so look at this, look at this vision, this piercing vision, uh, and then look at the darkness and the gradients of light. And now you see the different story. And that's kind of magic, because it goes from the literal to the poetic. Very important image. Now, did it stop you in your tracks? It did me. And when it does, it suggests that for that moment of time, I'm experiencing what the photographer must have seen and must have felt at that instant of time. Now, another issue with photography is that it's illusion. And in Plato's cave, uh, he had this premise. And the premise was, if prisoners were chained in this cave, and all they saw, all they saw were shadow images or images projected by the real. Would they understand the real? Would they see? What do you think? If all you saw were shadow images, that's all you could see, would you understand what was cast in the shadow? Hmm? Someone. Well, his answer was you couldn't. And you'd probably be talking about the shadow figures. All right. So let's make let's make a leap forward and go. Have we seen that again? <laughs> Have we seen that again? Do we confuse the cast images and the shadow figures with the real? Do we talk about stuff? I mean, how are the Kardashians doing? <laughs> I don't know. You know. 
do we talk about it, and does it, in, in some sense, begin to replace the real in our own minds? The Atlantic Magazine uh, had an uh, article that said, can you tell the difference between fantasy and reality? And the answer is yes. All right, good. Go ahead. Uh, the second was, do you? And the answer to that was much more complicated. Because in a lot of senses, the fantasy is so much better designed than reality. And we watch it. And so this was Plato's, uh, this was Plato's uh, kind of uh, uh, warning of this, is that people who know image don't necessarily know the world they live in. Oh, by the way, you shouldn't sit that close to me. <laughs> All right, so now I'm going to talk about the births of photography. Clearly, photography had a lot of tangential roots that came up from different places. Uh, photography is an optical process, it's a chemical or digital process, and it's a mental process. That's what photography is. The optics were known forever. What they couldn't get to line up was capturing the image so it would be fake. So these were, these were, that was a chemical process, and that didn't happen until 1826 or so, that a first image was able to be made. But the optics were known, and the camera obscure would be an example of that. This is the first photograph ever made, and it was by Nias Fournieps, and he did it on a pewter plate, and uh, the, the emulsion was bitumen of Judea, and he used lavender oil, to, uh, to make the image. He was so disappointed in this image that he hid it in an attic and it was found, it was found in the 20th century by Helmut Grimshine. It exists now at the University of Texas. Why was he disappointed? What do you think? It's not very sharp, is it? No, it's blurry. But it's blurry. And it's confusing. To his mind, he wanted clarity and evidence. He wanted the equivalent of the, uh, of the uh, principles of the Enlightenment. He wanted proof, identity, rational, logic. And this is illogical. So he hid it away. It was taken out of his window, and it took eight hours in order to make this exposure. And the, the shadow was cast in two different directions. And he goes, this is a mess. And he away. He later did a still life, and which is now no longer exists. This is the only form that you're going to see this in of, of, uh, of a table setting. And he did not have the problems with light because things were relative, uh, relatively uh, stable. But again, very crude and lacking uh, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of visual information. This is uh, Daguerre, and Daguerre is, uh, uh, was the father of photography in a lot of senses. Daguerre was a showman, and he painted dioramas in Paris. Dioramas are theaters where they have light projected onto uh, translucent, uh, transparent screens, and what he would do is create the illusion that you were actually in a physical space. Daguerre wanted to create photography to be that kind of illusion. So he uh, met with uh, Naps, and uh, Naps passed away. Daguerre took his secrets and then went on his way. But what's important here is that photography for Daguerre was <coughs> invented by accident. He had been trying to make an image that kept fading. Trying to make an image that kept fading. One night, he took an image, he put it in his medicine cabinet, and he woke up the next morning and there was an image. This is magic, by the way. There's an image. And what he realized was, in his medicine cabinet is a broken thermometer. And the thermometer had mercury, and the mercury went up to his polished silver plate and created the equivalent of development. It is the sharpest photographic process to this day. It is on the molecular level. 
and that's the Daguerre, and, and it was by accident, and he thought, this is delightful. And the French uh, gave him a pension for, uh, for his discovery. And this is an early daguerreotype, and um, the, uh, the uh, daguerreotype is very sharp, very clear, but it's also very delicate. And they said it was as fragile as butterfly wings. So if you touch it, the image goes up. And you can uh, begin to see abrasions and pennies and so forth. Uh, no formula, just thing. Yeah, uh, we need to do some investigative analysis on this one. This is a daguerreotype, done by Daguerre in 1838 in Paris. What do you see that stands out to you? What do you see that's notable? Hmm? The guy. Okay. Okay. What else do you see is notable? There's nobody else on the street. The exposure took eight minutes, and by the time eight minutes was elapsed, everything that was moving became invisible. It did not render, okay, except for that one person who was pausing to get his shoe shined. That is the first picture of a human being uh, taken in, uh, in a national environment. It's the very first picture. And it's quite by accident. He was getting his shoe shined. Can anybody identify this? It's topical. This is done by Robert Cornelius in 1839. This is the first selfie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this really is the first selfie. And Cornelius, 1839 was three years after Daguerre's announcement. In three years, he took that image of it himself, uh, and, it, and it's haunting to this day. So what I can divine from this is that photography became a tool for us to tell our own stories, for us to observe our own identities. Up to this point, only miniature painting. You had to pay a lot of money to have your little miniature done, and only the aristocracy was able to, to do that. Photography offered the promise, which is magic, that we could do the images of ourselves and chart our own lives. Cornelius was interested in his own self-image. Uh, uh, and so I, you know, Elizabeth persuaded me not to show you a bunch of selfies, but I always <laughs> wanted to do that. Because they're, they're absurd. They're absurd. <laughs> and this is the third poll. Uh, Curmudgeny Fox Talbot. Fox Talbot was a scientist in England, and Talbot uh, wanted to invent photography uh, using his own processes. So he and Daguerre and Amps didn't talk to each other, except at lawsuits. That's the only time they talked. And Talbot created actually the father of, or mother of uh, contemporary photography. Talbot created the negative. And what he did was uh, on this piece of paper, he put light sensitive emulsion and it created a negative image. And then he took that piece of paper and printed it on another piece of light sensitive paper, which created a positive. So that's the first negative. Now, the advantages here are multiple. First is you can sell a lot of them. Second is you could, you could reproduce them infinitely if you chose. And, um, and so Talbot uh, then made the notations here that this actually happened in 1835, which would have been one year before Daguerre. Now, do we believe him or not? Because this didn't come out until after Daguerre's announcement. So we, you know, it's a little, we don't know Fox. But what we do know is that the images were not very good. 
And they were not very good because the fibers of the paper interrupted the transparency of the image. And so you see the blurriness and the fuzziness, and it largely comes from, from the paper, which was the negative. That was later approved to be glass, uh, which is much more transparent than paper, and then later film. And now we, we don't use it. That's bad to say. But uh, so there are three births of photography for real. Niefs, Daguerre, and Fox Tower. Is photography true? How would you think about that? It is Michigan, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Well, let's just think about that. There are two kinds of photographic truth that I'd like to address. And they're contradictory in some senses, but but in the end, they're not. The first is called the window on the world. And the window on the world is that my photographs, let's say some of these, are like I'm looking through a picture window on the world. In that, um, in that what I expect to see are sharpness, clarity, great descriptive powers, and the illusion of reality. I expect to see precision, clarity, texture, shapes, sharpness, um, impartiality. I expect to see that. I expect to see in the window of the world that the photographer is somewhat absent, somewhat invisible. That's what I expect. And it, and it creates this kind of rational believability that we are very fond of here. Now, uh, you'll notice in here, and, and this gets to the question of rational believability, uh, how many rectangles do you see in here? Yeah. Okay, now this would be a rectangle too, wouldn't it, the screen? Okay, how about the room? Yeah, it'd be a rectangle. How about every single photograph up here? It's rectangular. How about that door? It's rectangle. We love rectangles. Are rectangles a function of our desire to map the world and make it more predictable and logical? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the actual photographic image, by the way, is round. The image that's actually made is round. We clip it off to be rectangular because we enjoy it. So um, the window on the world suggests that, that that rectangularity is uh, is a function of just the way it is. Right? That's pretty clear. Right? Now, what holds up a picture window? Yeah, frame and a wall. So, at the same time, there is an intellectual separation that's created, and we'll call it we'll call it a wall. You got to hold the picture up, the window up somehow. So, people who are drawn to the very specific kind of image, and you see some here that are more evocative than others, and some that are very specific, they're drawn to that display of fact, so-called fact, visual fact. We'll call that window of the world. Francis Frith, uh, in 1858, went to Egypt, Nubia, Palestine, and Syria, to photograph. And he took these images back to sell in England. These are the first National Geographic images. And he took them back because armchair travelers really just want to see the place and imagine that they're in, in the place that they're looking at. So Fripp did this using a big camera, albumin plates, and collodion glass plate negatives, which is the wet process. Now, Tell me some of the significant features that you see of this image. We're still in the window of the world. Yeah. Triangles. It's what? Triangles. Well, the triangles? Yeah. yeah. What else? The I can identify the sphinx. In it? In the corner, there's an image of a horse or something. Yeah, over here. Yeah, right here. What in the world 
is somebody doing up there? Or what are they doing here? Why are they there? I mean, would you be there? I'm going to go out and sit or hold my, my donkey in the desert. Okay, fine. No, it was done to create balance, composition that would appeal to the, to the Western European mind, and for scale. So what we can say is the window in the world implies an ordering and a patterning of the things that actually <coughs> happen in the world. I'm, I'm, how many of you tried to take pictures of people at parties? Right? Yeah. Don't they perform for the camera? Yeah. I'm really, you know, very dour, and then I get it from the camera and go, yeah, like that. <laughs> and so the camera has a certain a certain ability to project its desire onto people. Window in the world is one of the main motifs. Can anybody identify that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's me. And uh, Neil Arsenal's first step. Does anybody know what he said? Yeah. One small step from man. One giant leap for mankind. And he pretty much flubbed the line, but that's what he said. All right. Now, does that image conjure up that cultural knowledge? Yes, it does. So, being specific, it is all also referential to something we know. And that's part of our culture, that's part of who we are. And so, the image, while being very specific, specific and sharp and clear also is connected to the culture for which it was made. It's significant. Now, um, this segment goes to Dorothea Lange's FSA project. And the Farm Security Administration uh, took it upon itself to photograph the plight of the Dust Bowl and migrant workers in this country. And some of the great photographers of all time came out of this. And what I want to show you is uh, the, the difference between a truth and a different kind of truth. This is the situation that, one of the situations Dorothy Lang found. Okay? And there we see the Margaret mo mother and her children and the tent shanty and so forth. This is what, this is what she found. Where did that come from? It came from uh, Dorothy Lang, right? And so at the instant of, ex of exposure, and this is magic again, she conjured up an attention to that instant, the possibilities, and her entire life in that image. That's of her. It's of a narrative. It's of a story. And it is so much better than that. I'll go back to the fact. Right. If you're an anthropologist, OK, I'll give it to you. But that goes a kind of proof to the, to the mind and to the heart. And I think that is, uh, you know, it's one of the most amazing photographs I think you've ever made. And it will live forever because it will forever give its message. Now, on the other hand, there's the art effect. And that is uh, the art effect. In some photography, unsharp, vague, blurry images are read as feelings and effects directed toward inner meaning. Now, this will drive you nuts, yeah. right? Because you can't, you can't focus on any one thing and keep your focus. Uh, I mean, I've been accused of being that way myself, but, but Man Ray understood that. So he, what he understood then was photography is not a finished thing. It is an event that is suspended on the wall for us to participate in. You can never make closure on this image. Never. Because it will keep you going. Now, why is that? Well, this is a, a study by Noten and Stark from Scientific American. And what they did was they uh, hooked up uh, measurement devices to people's eyes. 
looking at the uh, Boston Nefertiti. And those marks right there are the scan paths and the places we dwell to recognize pattern. Now, we made an analogy of the camera and the eye, but in fact, we don't see like a camera. We see this thing and that thing, and this thing and that thing. Or if we're looking at someone, we then look at and we find the significant features so that we can recognize them. Uh, David Hockney, uh, the painter photographer, said, photography is okay if you don't mind viewing the world from the point of view of a paralyzed cyclops. <laughs> For a split second time. Right. So this gets to the idea, and I think you can see this now, I have this kind of focused vision, but I also have peripheral vision. Mm -hmm. And if I did not have the peripheral vision, I'd be at a loss. Because significant things happen on the periphery. That's where, that's where form emerges. Keith Carter understood this in Fireflies, 1992. Have you guys ever done this when you were kids? Yes. And it's not like you're collecting data. It's like you're collecting magic. And so, tell me the language that Carter used to portray this language. What are some significant features of this image? Because what he's dealing with is the imaginal, the sublime, the, the kind of mystery of it all. That's largely what this image is about. And that's magic. That a photograph can take you from the real, you know, the, I just stubbed my toe again, real, to this is darkness which lets me expand into it. Now, if you recall the first image of the Earth, it was surrounded by this incredible darkness, which was very, very significant. That which we know and that which we can imagine are both on the, the cusp of the point of when the image is made. So, I gave you a set for the uh, sharp, clear images in the world. Here's a set for, uh, for this kind of image. It has to show presence. And that's the illusion of reality that's so strong you seem to be gazing at the scene, unaware of the, of the photographer and the lens. This is a viewer that is transported by the image. Now, I don't think too many of us thought about the photographer when we first saw that. We were immediately transported into the image. Essence. The underlying levels of meaning in the photograph are not ordinary. They're not low-hanging fruit. They're extraordinary. They're magical, perhaps. I have to think that Keith Carter understood what he was doing here. And I have to think that he made the choices that were correct. Authenticity. It suggests that what I'm looking at must be true. True to fact? No, not so much. True to spirit? Oh, yeah. And so we have very conflicting kinds of uh, reports uh, coming photographic. And then the final point is there's a certain innocence of eye that's associated with uh, <clears throat> artifact images. And the innocence of eye is, uh, according to Michael White, is seeing as a child with wonder and amazement. When that happens, and it, when you take photographs and it happens to you, and you go, wow, where did that come from? That's the kind of innocence of eye, where we don't, where we don't arrange everything. We kind of meet it when it happens to us. Right? So that would be a good set for uh, looking at uh, our effect images. Been there, done that. Isn't that amazing? Pillars of creation from the Hubble telescope. 
Now, informationally, it's extraordinary. But also, conceptually, it's, it's extraordinary. Because it takes me to a point where the image is no longer an object, it is an effect. It moves me. Right? And that is part of the magic of photography, is that these images uh, move us. If they're good. If they're bad, we, you know, we're slightly irritated. <laughs> Is photography truthful? 1851, H.P. Robinson um, did this image, and it caused a scandal. What? 1851, in England, caused a scandal <coughs> because so, they said, "How could you be so insensitive to, to photograph this scene? Here is a girl passing away from tuberculosis. Her mother, her sister, and her father looking out into." The, the stormy clouds in the heavens that caused this tragedy. They were scandalized. Uh, Robinson was, was vilified. Now, Robinson then revealed he made it up. In other words, he took each one of these people and put them together in this composite image, and which became a, a way of telling stories. Then people were really outraged. <laughs> because they said, you deceived us. Photography is to tell the truth. And you deceived us. And, uh, and in fact, yeah, you did. So we can say that if these are illusions, if these are illusions, these photographs, they cannot be the real. The menu cannot be the meal. The map can't be the territory. All right, so I, I'll tell my lame joke here. Um, <laughs> Picasso is at a party, and you know Picasso's painting. And a uh, photographer comes up and says, why don't you ever paint anything that looks real? And Picasso goes, what do you mean? You know, my paintings do look real. I use real paint. I use real motion. They're real. What do you mean? The photographer goes, don't play no with me. You, you know what I'm talking about. And he goes, no, perhaps you can show me. So he goes, okay, fine. You know, reaches into his wallet and pulls out a picture of his wife. And he goes, this is what I mean by real. Why don't you ever paint anything that looks real? And Picasso goes, now I understand what you're saying. My, she's tiny, isn't she? <laughs> <laughs> so we take a lot of this reading of information for being a kind of truth. But in fact, it's illusion. And that's one thing we should remember from today. And, and they're very good ones. And they can be very uh, wonderful illusions. Uh, here is uh, Alexander Gardner in uh, the Civil War. Has anybody seen this before? This is, uh, well, if you have, don't give it much. So uh, <clears throat> here, uh, Gardner was, was documenting the Civil War and selling it to people in New York. They thought it would be very soon. This is at Gettysburg. And he photographed the last resting place of a rebel sharpshooter. Right? Look at the image. What do you see there? You're a rebel sharpshooter. And, and you got it. The gun. Are you going to? Aesthetically, place your gun before you go. No. Oh, one last thing I do before I. No. Gardner placed the gun like that. He created that situation. In fact, that guy didn't die there. Later, later studies showed that guy had died elsewhere and they dragged him because he was an appropriate subject and put him here. Now, can you tell the difference between that? and the real, because it's presented as if it's very factual. But really, it is using that illusion of fact to tell, uh, to tell some sort of plumber. Uh, fake news. <laughs> <laughs> I believe the news. <laughs> Stopping time. Uh, Leland Stanford, uh, uh, from Stanford University in California, had a horse called Occident. 
And what Stanford uh, employed Edward Mybridge to do was to photograph oxygen and see if the horse's hooves left the ground at any point in time. The pictorial convention was, no, they didn't. You know the hobby horse yeah. convention where two legs are out and two legs are out that way? I can't do it. And uh, <laughs> that was the pictorial convention. He took this one image uh, of oxygen and uh, he was working in very controlled conditions, so he measured the situation. And he found indeed the horse's hooves leave the ground. And, uh, and Stanford won his $25,000 bet. And I think this is a fascinating image. Yeah, it is. Isn't it amazing? Uh, Myrich went on to do a book called Animal Locomotion, in which he, he talked about the form moving in space, uh, not frozen. And this is Sally Gardner. And here you can clearly see the hooves all leave the ground, which was extraordinary. Which gets me to another topic of the magic of photography, is that you can see things you, you could not see with your own eyes. That photography gives us an advantage. You can see things that are slow, you can see things that are fast, and you can understand dynamics of things in a way you could not simply from observation. Now, if you took all this, and you can actually go on the internet and look up Edward Weinbridge, if you took all these and you sequenced them and you flipped one after the next, you would see the virtual motion of the horse. And Weinbridge, a photographer, actually in a lot of ways, sort of cinema. That's what cinema is, in the old days at least, is a frame and a frame and a frame and a frame. And that's what Weinbridge is for as well. It wasn't easy in those days. This is Jacob Reese in a photograph called Bandit's Roost uh, in, in New York. Now, these guys are at hombres, right? And Reese took the equivalent of a flash camera to photograph these guys. Now, the flash camera in those days was magnesium powder that you put in the trough and you lit it. All right, so get the picture here. He's got a big stand camera. He's going into Bandit's Roost, and then what he does is he flashes an explosion in front of him. And he got this, this uh, very remarkable image. That sets up the paradigm that photographers can be adventurers and be heroic. They can place themselves in harm's way, and, and they will do that quite often. War photographers, uh, all kinds of. So there's a kind of extension from safety into the unknown that's always implicit in uh, this kind of photograph. I would not hang out there, <laughs> frankly. And much to uh, the amazement of everyone, uh, and mysteriously, the, the thing exploded in the Lakers, I believe. And the photographer was there. Is this a lucky shot? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Wow. yes. What do you think? You got yeses? Yes. I'm reminded of what Louis Pasteur said. Luck always favors the prepared mind. Not sometimes, always. always. So this photographer was prepared at the instant that something happened. Other photographers were <coughs> not. They were fumbling with their, their, their camera bag. This one wasn't. And so, in that instant of exposure, he was there, 100%. At the turn of the century, P.H. Emerson was asked the question, <laughs> is photography art? The expected answer was, no, it's not art. In fact, institutionally, you, a lot of people do not. 
that's not our salvation. And, uh, and Emerson's answer was disarming. He said, it is perhaps the greatest art of all. Because everything that must be known has to be known in that instant of that time. You can't go back. In painting, you can go back. Right? In photography, you can't go back. You have to be there. And you have to be prepared. So one could say that photography as an act certainly informs us intellectually, but you could also say it forms us on the inside as well, in the forefront. And so it makes us very aware and astute if we don't follow the bad habits and patterns. Uh, whoops, I want to go back to stopping time. Now, Doc Edgerton uh, at MIT uh, developed the stroke, and he did a number of these shots. He came to visit us in, in, uh, at Ohio State, and uh, it's fascinating. Uh, he also developed the stroke for the war effort, uh, because in aerial reconnaissance in World War II, if you, if you were taking a, a photograph, you had to throw a flare out. Well, the problem with that is it makes a perfect trace back to the source, right? And so this was a very dangerous act. So what he did was he created a giant battery in, in strobe. And he said the capacitors were the biggest problem with these. And he flashed one uh, and held a piece of newspaper in front of it with a yardstick, and the thing caught on fire. It was that much energy that was coming out of that. And he invented the strobe. And then he did studies at MIT. And this, that is a bullet being shot from a rifle in a, in a uh, stage condition and what happens when it goes through an hour. I never saw that before. I could never see that before. But, but now <coughs> I can't unsee it. It has become part of my vocabulary, part of my knowledge. So it stops time. But uh, I'm going to end this part of the, and then I'll open up for comments or questions. So. Anything. But uh, our show that's coming up is Ansel Adams, and uh, and I just uh, we can stop time. But the other aspect of that, which I think is the real magic of photography, is it stops us. Right, it stops us, and so we pay attention for that split second of time, that window, that opening, that opportunity, and we're stopped, we're arrested, and we pay attention to it. Now, it, life flows on. It's just fun. But when you, when you have a camera and you have a strong relationship with that which you are seeing, you're stopped because it moves you, moves you to, to your core. Adams had, apparently, uh, from what I understand, one opportunity to make this image. The light was fading. He saw it, and he thought, uh, this is an image I have to have. How did he do it? Should we go back and reshoot? <laughs> no, we can't. He can't. Because whatever Adams is, and that, that's a topic for another conversation, he brought it to the table. And he himself became transparent in the situation. It's not about the camera anymore. It's about the image. Now, the image is made of what? <laughs> Light and shadow, the known and the unknown. What a delicate balance and delicate relationship between the known and the unknown. The light of the moon is different than the light of the sun. The light of the moon, the light of the sun is exacting, it's scrutiny, it's, it's understanding. The light of the moon is reflected light, and it speaks a different message. So, uh, Moonrise, Fernandez, New Mexico. All right, well, that's what I have for you today. Uh, and um, do you have any comments or questions or anything you want to talk about? <laughs>